you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? family my name is Shane Bryant and I hope um, this day finds you and your loved ones well I'm um, again it's Sunday 7th of June um, and it's a day of worship and we get to work um, get together and worship through God's Word this morning um, just as a recap last week I started a series It's going to probably be a 12 to 16 part series on the first chapter of the book of Colossians and um, the series is called Christ in You, 
the hope of glory. And you will remember that phrase that comes out of Colossians chapter 1, verses 27. So just as a reminder, let me just give you a Colossians 1, 27 through 29, so we can get a bit of context in it. It says this, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning, admonishing, telling with fervency everyone, and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this, Paul, our toil, struggling with all his energy, Christ's energy, that he powerfully works in me. So as a recap, just quickly, last week we dealt with the introduction, and I just want to recap two of the main reasons why Paul had written to this church. Number one, it was a polemic. A polemic is a controversial argument. And Paul is uh, raising up this polemic against false teachings, um, controversial heresies, and false teachings that are infiltrating, looming and infiltrating the church at Colossae. And a second reason for his um, occasion for this letter is because he needs to give some cr strong Christian advice. In other words, for good Christian living and loving the church as Christ loves the church. And you'll cross-reference that to Ephesians 5, 25. Today, I want to concentrate on a little word found in verse 4, and that is faith. And that's going to be the subject, the topic of today's sermon. So I want to read to you Colossians uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4a. And it goes on from 4a to speak about a whole lot of stuff like love, the saints, hope, the truth, gospel. But I want to hone on this little word faith. So I'm going to take it from verse 1 through verse 4a. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in, the, in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you since we heard of your faith. Now again, I've spoken about this numerous times before, but um, faith and what true faith means, where faith comes from, it comes from Christ alone. But I want to actually bring up some worldly definitions of faith. Um, two, one is from the Oxford Dictionary and one's from an online site. And this is how the world seems to perceive what faith is. Now I'm going to give you the three points out of the Oxford Dictionary concerning this little word faith and see what the Oxford Dictionary has to say uh, and and you, you see where it is correct, and you can see where it's actually completely and utterly wrong. It says this as follows. There's three points. Point number one, faith is a confidence or trust in a person or thing, i.e. having faith in another's ability, like having faith in this chair I'm sitting in. Hopefully it won't break. Point number two, a belief that is not based on proof or evidence. Man, that we're going to get to, that is just so wrong. And then three, belief in God or in the doctrines or teachings of religion. So that seems to be a subjective thing and not objective. And when I look at the Bible, faith, Romans 10, 17, comes from hearing and hearing comes from the word of God. And it, therefore, it is more objective than subjective, although it is subjective, but it needs to be objective, come through the noose, the understanding, and then reach the heart. And then faith is solidified in this in the subjective because of the objective. There's another online site. I'm not going to name it. Um, it's in my document. But this is what this online site has to say regarding um, faith and um, according to this online reporter. And it says this as follows. Faith is the ascent of the mind to the truth of a statement for which there is incomplete evidence. This seems to be an Eastern kind of type of thinking. Um, the specific side goes on to say this, and further on to this uh, um, description of faith, meaning, and faith is neither the submission of the reason, nor is it the acceptance, simply and absolutely upon testimony, for what reason cannot reach. 
Faith is the being able to cleave to a power of goodness appealing to our higher and higher and and real self, not to our lower and apparent self. So faith apparently is me. It's almost this uh, autonomous thing, this relativism that we live in. Um, I believe in myself. I, I think positively, and therefore I cling, cleave to the power of goodness, which I think I, is appealing in me. I find in me and to my real self, and um, which is the higher power, and not to a lower and apparent self. So therefore, faith is actually this kind of boosting of myself. I believe in myself, and I believe in good people. Whatever they do, the good things that they do, but I'm not going to cleave to the, the things that they do wrong. We're sinners. We do things wrong. Nevertheless, faith, according to the Oxford Dictionary and to this online uh, site, is apparently abstract. There's no evidence. Now, I want you, you to take note of what I've just read to you. According to the dictionary and one of the online and one of these online sites that I quoted from, is faith is nothing more than some sort of abstract belief in something else or even some sort of God or God, lowercase g or uppercase g, depending on how you see things, with no evidence at all. It may also be some sort of belief in another person or even in yourself, as we have just read from the quote, um, and the guy's name is Matthew Arnold, just for, for the record. This is far from how the Bible defines faith to be. You need to know that this is the furthest thing from how the Bible describes faith and also teaches us what faith is. To add even more insults to injury or to this erroneous description, there are even Christians who, who think, Christians who think that faith is just a mere belief, a shot in the dark, in other words. Again, it's like a blind faith. Just um, I just believe because I, my granny told me. I believe it's just like I, I, um, it's just a shot in the dark. Again, let me assure, assure you with absolute conviction that this is not at all the way the Bible teaches or describes faith to be. Worldly defined faith is prone to change. If faith is merely just a belief system, that is most certainly is will be prone to change at one time or another. So let us be honest, we have all changed our minds and beliefs at some point um, in something or someone at one time or another. For example, you may believe that the earth is flat. There are those people uh, that purport that the earth is flat, so we're just all just hallucinating the earth is by no means um, round. Um, but then you might come to the truth and you say, well, look, I mean, there's a there's, uh, um, Hubble telescope, there, there, there's, there's um, uh, um, satellites that have taken pictures of the Earth. The Earth is most certainly round. So, again, you may change your mind about something, your belief system, but that's not necessarily how faith works. Many years ago, I used to believe that God sees me now, again, this is what I got from the teaching of the church that I used to be in. God sees me either in heaven or in hell, depending on the right choices I make. If I make the choice that rejects God, then I land up in hell. If I make a choice for Him um, uh, and believe on Him, I will land up in heaven. That is what I used to believe. I got this notion out of 1 Peter 2 verses 4 through 8. How in the world um, did I come to that con conclusion? It stumps me to this very day because that is not at all what 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 8 says. Again, if anyone would read the Bible for all that it's worth, I've got to tell you, since I have studied the scriptures as much as I can, and I'm not the expert on this, belief system, that belief system of mine has changed dramatically since I've actually delved into God's Word, reading it, solar scriptura, letting God's Word exegete itself to me. In fact, let me say that not only was it completely erroneous, the thinking of mine, but actually very, very dangerous. Let me tell you why. Scripture does not make that claim at all, that God either sees me in heaven or in hell, depending 
on. I mean, he so he he's he's known from all history. And if Shane's going to have that faith, he's going to be with me. And if Shane's not going to have that faith, he's going to go to hell. That is just so far from the scripture. That's so far from the truth of, especially what um, one Peter verses two um, through four to eight says. Let me find it for you, and I'm going to read it for you. One Peter two, verses three, um, four to eight. As you come to him, that's Jesus Christ, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying a, in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone or the head of the corner. So there again, one might see, okay, well, gee, okay, if, if, if I believe, um, I'll go to heaven, but if I don't believe, I'm going to be rejecting him, and I'm going to be cast out, and that, it goes on to say that rock, rock becomes a stumbling, a rock of offense for me. Dear ones, no one chooses or can choose Christ. It's a, it's, it, it's, an, it's a, a human ability in our carnality, in our carnal flesh, we are un unable to choose God by our own volition. We might ascribe or subscribe to the word as a belief system. We might just be religious people that go to church. But we do not choose Christ or God out of our own volition. You need to know that man is utterly, um, comprehensively depraved and corrupt from the day of his birth. He has a sinful nature inherited from our first father, Adam, and our first mother, Eve. And therefore, Scripture teaches that God, God is the one who chooses his own. He is the one that makes the choice through Christ Jesus. Furthermore, when he chooses a specific person, um, if faith is left up to us, we would never be able to make that right choice at all. You've got to understand that. So if when he chooses, he does it from his own redemptive volition from eternity past. He's already made that choice. If we would go to Genesis chapter 4. Verse 1. Yes, verse 1 to 8. Let me just give you an example. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 to 8. Now, Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, his brother, also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. That is another story for another time. Um, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. His countenance became disheartened. He became disheartened and angry. So now, says verse 6, The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, if you do well, will, not you, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching, it's sitting at the door. And its desire is for you. It wants to rule over you, but you must rule over it. Verse 8, Cain spoke to his able brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed 
him. According to the Bible, let me just say the opposite of faith is disobedience. And yeah, we have just read an account where God had warned Cain that sin was literally crouching at the door. Disobedience was crouching at the door. So according to the Bible, the opposite of faith is disobedience. The Bible teaches this over and over. Now, if it was disobedience that caused the first man, Adam and Eve, the woman, to sin, then by the implication, the same implication, same logic, the opposite of faith has to be disobedience. And if disobedience is the opposite of faith, then the natural outcome of disobedience would then be sin. That's what we call sin, missing the mark, being rebellious against God. Therefore, faith can, cannot just merely be a belief system. It has to be much more than that. If the sum of faith is simply intellectual assent, then what happens next? If it is simply just believing one thing or another intellectually or even trusting one thing or another, then what happens when I do not believe in that thing anymore? For instance, if I no longer believe in a flat earth theory and now believe in a round earth, then by simple logic, I am now being disobedient to our, which I originally believed. It's logical. If, 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 if faith is literally just an ascent, and I believe in the goodness of that and, and give my heart to that, and then suddenly turn around and, no, no, I don't believe it anymore, I believe in that, then you're actually really being disobedient to your original thought. You're changing your mind. One would say you're changing your mind. But it's actually you've rejected the first thought that you gave your heart to, and you no longer believe in that. And that's what the, the dictionaries tell us. That's what some online researchers tell us and that is not faith simply believing intellectually then there is no hope left for us because this is not the way scripture speaks of faith and also defines faith to be let me just reiterate faith cannot be believing in you don't see my bookshelf my bookshelves up here and those are full of books and i've got a whole lot of books um i've even got the quran up here um that i can con I converse um have conversation with my muslim friends and stuff like that and then just suddenly, um, just no, I, I don't believe those books are there. I don't believe they, uh, I believe in something else. That's just me intellectually changing my mind. But the Bible describes faith as coming from God. And when sin comes crouching at your door and you kind of cave into the sin, then you're being disobedient to that original faith. Romans 4.23, 14.23 says, whatever does not proceed from God-given, I put in brackets, God-given faith is what? Is sin. Romans 14, 23 says that. Whatever does not proceed from God-given faith is sin. The question that needs to be asked, dear ones, is why does Romans 14, 23 say this about faith? And whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Faith in and of itself is obedience. It is not just believing what you really just want to believe in a relativistic way, in an autonomous way, but it is actually obedience. It is being persuaded by God's word, by God himself, and by Jesus Christ. The Greek word for faith is the word pistis, and it means this. It is to be persuaded that something is true and then place your trust in it. However, it is far more than just intellectual belief. In fact, the root word for uh, um, pistis is patho, and it means to obey. So faith, pistis, and patho, the root word, it actually means to believe and to obey at the same time. It's not just believing that this chair is holding me. I'm not obeying the chair, and the chair is not obeying me. This chair can cave in whenever it wants to. So again, pistis is to be persuaded by something and then place your trust in it, and the root word, patho, means to obey. So to have faith according to biblical standards and what the Bible means, we are to believe in Christ, that's the message of the Bible, 
and to be persuaded that it's true through the Holy Spirit and through the faith that has been placed in our heart which leads to obedience. Here's a famous verse, John 14, 15. If you love me, Jesus speaking to his um, disciples, if you love me, you will, what? Pistis, patho, trust in and obey my commands. John 3.36 says this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Belief, pistis, patho, the root word. Who believes, places his trust, is persuaded, and obeys. You've got to see the context. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Here's the converse. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. What does that mean? The unbelieving reprobate. It means that person who rejects that type of commitment to Christ. I just like to read the Bible, I like to go to church, I like to listen to the music. Sometimes the music is great, sometimes it sucks. That's according to people's opinions. And um, I like to get together afterwards and talk about business and golf and everything um, after the service. Family, the Bible marries faith and obedience in accord. It marries, marries the two are the two together, faith and obedience. Um, both the word faith and obedience, believing together, it puts both of those things together. In fact, in the above verse in John 3.36, um, it tells us the opposite of believing is what? This obedience. Therefore, believing is also faith. And they are one and the same because faith is obedience and it calls for obedience through the persuasion, through the gift, and only through the gift of God, through Jesus Christ, and his persuasive work he does in your heart through the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 has this to say. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, or is it 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. Two eight. I must just check my cross reference here. I don't have them wrong. Yes, two Thessalonians, verse one, chapter one, verse five to eight. This is it. The, and in fact, it starts off with a forensic statement. This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considered it considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief or divine joy. There's that, there's a, there, it can mean both. Relief or divine joy to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with these mighty angels in flaming fire. Now listen to this. Inflicting vengeance on those who do not no, there's a very, very um, intimate word there. No God. And on those who do not, here's the converse, obey. They are disobedient. Do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, just as a bit of a digression, you cannot say you love God and not obey Him. You cannot say you love God and as the Bible says, hate your brother. You cannot say you love God and have unforgiveness and and all of that stuff. Here is a forensic um, part of evidence to us about how the judgment of God works to those who have faith and to those who, who literally disobey His Word. So now, Paul is giving thanks to the Colossian church and for the Colossian church. And why does he give thanks? He gives thanks to God in verse 3. It is because he has heard of their obedient faith and therefore it is their obedient faith that is an encouragement to him he's actually blown over and if you listen last week he never ever was at the church of Colossae the church of Colossae was birthed because of his his, evangel his first missionary journey um, into Asia Minor and all a second and third perhaps and the church of Colossae was birthed through the word of Paul and Barnabas James 5.16 says that the prayer of the righteous man has great power as it is working. 
Imagine the prayer of Paul, that righteous prayer of Paul, where he is praying for a righteous people, righteous made in God, not by their own, but because of God. He makes him righteous because of their what? Their obedient faith. It touches the heart of God from two sides. The prayer of Paul, because of his amazement in what Christ has done, he just in awe of Christ, in awe of God. And then the obedient faith of these Colossian Christians. Family again, biblical faith is no leap in the dark. As you can see from scripture, biblical faith is most certainly no leap in the dark, a shot in the dark, a blind faith. According to scripture, faith is obedient. Pistis patho. And because of obedience, Jesus Christ makes it solid and unshakable. Hebrews 11 verse 1 to 2. Now faith is the assurance of things hopeful and the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation because of that faith. Commendation because of faith. Take note of that. It's a commendation. What does that mean? It means to bear witness, to testify, to give evidence and a good report. That's the, what, what the word means, commendation. So they were, they, they were witnesses, they bore witness, they testified, and they did it with good evidence and a good report historically. So you need to know again that scripture over and over attests to faith that is obedient, and therefore, because even in the Old Testament and the saints of the Old Testament, they were obedient to God through faith. God has given them, God himself has given them this good report, as we read in Hebrews. The Lamb's Book of Life, a good report. That's my next heading. Let's take it one step further. God has given people such as those... Um, a written report because of the faith. What is the best report God can give to any person? He writes their name in the Lamb's Book of Life. That is the best report that God can give to any person. Revelation 21, 27 says that. And then he says in the book of Matthew 25, 21, well done. He says this to the faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Again, it is because of the faith, the pistis and the patho. The pistis is a belief, an objective and subjective belief. And then this patho, the root word, meaning the obeying of God. And that's why he gives them that good report. He writes their names in the Lamb's Book of Life, Revelation 21, 27, and then also... Again, in Matthew 25, verse 21. Now, another heading. A warning against a relapse back into the world. That's in Colossians 1, verses 21 to 23. So, I want to end by reading verses 21 to 23 of Colossians chapter 1. And giving you a warning as a Christian, and also perhaps if you're not a Christian, but especially to the Christian, relapsing back into your old ways, those ways that you were once separated from God. It were, was evil ways, and it separated you from God. It's like God telling Cain, sin is crouching at your door, and if you take hold of it, it will desire, it will overpower you, and it will separate you. That's the implication. So let's go back to the book of Colossians, and I'm going to read to you verses 21 to 23. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he, Christ, has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present, your, uh, present you holy and blameless and above reproach. It's, it's amazing how it puts blameless and above reproach, meaning blameless and above blameless before him. So he just makes you holy, he separates you, and makes you blameless and above blameless. He goes beyond blameless. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope 
of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, or in other words, to every single creature. How many Christians are there that have fallen back into the old ways? Those ways that once separated them from Almighty God, His Son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb who came to take away the sins of the world. How many Christians have fallen into this trap? How many Christians, those who once said they loved Jesus and were willing to follow Him all their days, have fallen back into their old ways? Those ways that classified them as hellbound, unsaved sinners. How many Christians at this very moment in time are dabbling again with their old wicked ways? It is those very old ways, those wicked ways, dear ones, family, that seem to be making more sense to them right now instead of Jesus Christ. There are some Christians who have seen, well, Christians who seem to have grown tired of following after Christ because the path is hard. The path is narrow. And again, surprise, surprise, they were under a misapprehension from the beginning because the path of Christ was never easy to start with. It was almost like the sales product that was given to them. If you believe in Christ, listen, this is going to happen. And you know, again, I want to repeat myself. I've said this so many times. This thing of an altar call, when you get called up, and you feel convicted, the pastor's preached and stuff like that, you can get convicted and the pastor calls you up, he's got a group of ushers and elders there, and they, you do a sinner's prayer, but they actually pray for you. They put the words in your mouth, what you are actually praying, and you actually never really repented. The re repentance prayer does not need to be five paragraphs long, and it doesn't need to be even one word long. It comes from the heart. All it just it takes is, Lord, I believe you died for me. Lord, I believe that you have chosen me. Lord, I am a sinner. Forgive me. And again, again, as Ravi Zachariah said, I will leave no stone unturned so that the gospel of Christ may go out through me. So again, that's what faith is. That's what faith is all along. Yes, we are still sinners being sanctified from day to day, but family, faith is obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ because He first loved us. So Colossians 1 verse 23 is an encouraging statement. It's an encouraging section of Scripture. So in light of that, I want to encourage you just to like Paul is encouraging the Colossian church, I want to encourage you in the same way to continue in the faith, firmly established by God and steadfast, not moved from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. Do not go back to the philosophies, the philosophia, the loving of the wisdom of your old ways and those of the world because it is crouching at your door and its desire is to overcome you. And remember what you used to be and how you used to be. But rather hold fast to the one, Christ Jesus, who is in you. And he is your hope of glory. So again, just to conclude, verse 3, We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. I pray for you. We pray for other Christians. Yes, we pray for the salvation of family members and their souls. But ultimately, it's God who, who draws people to Him. But we pray especially for the church, that the church may be the buttress of all truth. That's what the Bible actually says. So, Father, we thank You for today. We thank You, Lord, for Your Word. We thank You, Lord, that Your Word is true. We thank You, Lord, that... We can find everything for our daily bread and for tomorrow in your word, for the speeding of our souls. We don't have to go to the Oxford Dictionary and have a debate on how faith is just subjective depending on the person. That's just relativistic, Lord. 
But Father, we have an objective faith that you have given us. And it's a faith that has caused, called us to carry our cross, take up our cross, and follow after you. If you went to Calvary and died on a cross, then Father, our cross, Lord, that we carry, our suffering, pales in the light of what you did for us. So Father, I encourage those Christians that have fallen back to return to you as we read in the book of Jeremiah so many times. Return to me, return to me, return to me. And Lord, it's the heart of a loving God who has chosen the people unto himself. And those who God has given Jesus, no man can snatch out of his hand. So I pray for those Christians who have kind of backslidden, who have become disillusioned. And Father, I find that quite ironic because your Bible is not an illusion. Your word is not an illusion. So we use that word disillusionment as if your word was an illusion and now we have turned away from the illusion. No, we're disillusioned by our own selves because we've been trusting in an illusion of our own faith. But your faith is no illusion. It's concrete. It's true. It's everlasting to everlasting. We thank you for that. And I pray by your Holy Spirit, impregnate, convict those whom you have called so they 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 themselves might be a light a city on a hill that people might see and glorify our father god gracious to thousands upon thousands they might glorify him in christ jesus and thank you for the indwelling of the holy spirit amen well i pray your day is or your evening wherever you're listening is filled with joy and by that I mean the joy of that which only Christ can bring, that joy that transcends our understanding and works in our hearts and, 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 and fixates our eyes on our Lord Jesus Christ. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may he make his face to shine upon you and lift up his countenance to you. Have a great day or evening. Shalom.